Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, Chapter 25 in uh, Michigan's Money and Banking Textbook, uh, Transmission Channels. And we're going to divide this into two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be on interest rate-based transmission channels, and the second part will be on non-interest rate-based transmission channels. And in any sort of introductory macroeconomics course or even an uh, intermediate macroeconomics course, uh, generally you had a fairly straightforward uh, mechanism or way in which a change in monetary policy impacted the economy. And it went something along these lines, maybe, is that you have an expansionary monetary policy, for example, uh, that pushes down economy-wide interest rates. Uh, you then have maybe an increase in consumption, uh, an increase in investment, and both of those obviously are part of aggregate demand. And then you'd see overall economic activity rise, you know, uh, employment will rise, and maybe possibly inflation as well. And it turns out, however, that there are a whole wide variety of ways through which changes in monetary policy can impact the economy. And most of this work uh, has been uh, developed over about the last 25 years ago, 25 years or so, and these are called transmission channels. And so what we're going to do is, uh, in all the following examples, uh, assume an expansionary monetary policy. And so what we have first is the standard interest rate effect. And this is similar to what I was just describing just a second ago. And so we have an expansionary monetary policy, and that might reduce uh, interest rates, especially real interest rates, through the economy. And we might, uh, in turn, see a number of real variables impacted. Uh, for example, consumption, especially uh, maybe the purchase of new automobiles, which are generally uh, purchased uh, with credit, of course. And as interest rates fall, uh, the demand for automobiles might rise. Uh, investment by firms, we might be able to tell some story that a reduction in interest rates, again, especially real interest rates, would work to reduce the uh, user cost of capital. That would tend to increase the optimal capital stock. And as the optimal capital stock rises, that would work to increase investment throughout the economy. And then maybe might, there might be a stimulative effect on the housing market. Uh, lower, mortgage, uh, lower mortgage rates would be uh, correlated with an increase in demand for, say, new housing. And that would, of course, work to increase investment as well. And so, in effect, what we'd see is these, all these factors working to increase aggregate demand. And this would tend to increase real GDP, increase employment, and also possibly increase inflation as well. And what I want to emphasize here is two things. First, uh, the real rate and not so much the nominal rate is the important driver here. So again, remember the basic Fisher equation. And then also to get this uh, uh, to work best, uh, sticky prices are particularly helpful because if you think back to the Chapter 5 videos and the liquidity effect in terms of how a change in monetary policy can initially affect interest rates, uh, that uh, required sticky prices, in other words, prices not adjusting uh, right away to changes uh, uh, in policy. And so you need this to last or to win out at least for a while, not forever, but at least for a little bit. Now. We turn to the open economy interest rate effect. The idea here is that our previous discussion with the standard interest rate effect, uh, it was all about domestic consumption and domestic investment. Well, it turns out that changes in monetary policy can also affect exports and imports. So let's see, see how this might work. So what we want to figure out first is that a decrease in interest rates in the United States will tend to cause the U.S. dollar to depreciate. Well, you know, think of it like this. So as interest rates in the U.S. fall relative to interest rates in other countries, holding U.S. financial assets becomes less attractive uh, for people in the U.S. And as a result, what they might do is they might buy more foreign financial assets because foreign financial assets have a relatively higher interest rate. To do that, what they'll need to do, of course, is to first supply dollars into the foreign exchange market to trade them for foreign uh, currency. And an increase in supply of dollars, that will tend to depreciate the value of the U.S. dollar. Likewise, people in the rest of the world will see that U.S. financial assets offer a relatively less attractive yield. And they will demand fewer U.S. dollars in order to buy fewer U.S. financial assets. And so as a result, the demand for dollars falls. So when you have an increase in supply of dollars and a decrease in demand for dollars, that uh, will clearly work to push down the value of the U.S. dollar relative to other currencies. And once the value of the dollar falls, that works to increase exports because everything priced in dollars suddenly goes on sale to people in the rest of the world and will tend to uh, 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 decrease imports because now things priced in foreign currency becomes relatively more expensive. So imports tend to, tend to decrease. So with exports rising and imports falling, we tend to see a net increase in uh, exports and therefore an increase in aggregate demand. 
We also have what's called the cash flow effect. So the bottom line here is this. Uh, and this, by the way, works through um, especially nominal interest rates. And the idea here is very straightforward. A decrease in especially nominal interest rates works to improve business cash flow. And the reason is very simple. Most businesses are net borrowers. And so to the extent that interest rates fall, that will improve their cash flow position. Now, what does this do? Well, this reduces what's called adverse selection and moral hazard. And once adverse selection and moral hazard are, are reduced, those issues are reduced, then that tends to increase bank lending. Bank lending tends to increase especially investment, possibly even consumption. And of course, both of those will work to increase aggregate demand. Now, to fully understand this, of course, we need to figure out, well, gee, what the heck is adverse selection and what the heck is moral hazard? Well, adverse selection is all about uh, the type of people who show up to a bank or other financial institutions looking to borrow money. So what we can do is put these uh, uh, folks who show up looking to borrow money into two buckets, people who are good risks and people who are bad risks. Now, of course, in real life, there's a whole continuum uh, in terms of really bad risks and really good risks, but let's just for the sake of argument suppose we have two types, people who are going to be able to pay the money back that they borrow and those who are not, the bad risks. And of course, not surprisingly, what a bank will try to do is to sort between or differentiate between those two types of people. Now let's imagine this situation. Suppose that you're a bank lending officer and that one day you come to work and you find a whole line of people uh, waiting at your desk to borrow money. And let's imagine that you have, say, a million dollars that day to lend. And you survey all the people waiting in line and you discover that they collectively want to borrow $2 million. Well, of course, you can't meet all that demand. And if you think, gosh, that's really great, we have a lot of demand for our loans. And so what we can do then is we can raise our interest rates. And so you raise the interest rate on your loan from, say, 5% up to, say, 8 or 9%. And what will happen is that some of the people waiting in line will leave because they'll look at the, what they're trying to borrow money for and they just will find it uh, not worthwhile to borrow and they'll simply go away. And let's suppose you just raise interest rates just enough so that the people remaining in line want to borrow collectively a million bucks, which is, of course, exactly what you happen to have to lend. And so you think, great, you've solved your problem. But here is a problem you have, however, created, is that the bad risks are more likely to be still standing in line. Your good risks, in other words, have left. Your bad risks are willing to pay those higher interest rates because maybe they have a really risky project that might pay off really big. Maybe you have some people who are a little bit delusional who think maybe they've uh, discovered, for example, a uh, perpetual motion machine and want to borrow money to finance it. Or you have, of course, outright crooks who want to borrow money from your bank and simply disappear with it. And the problem is this, again, summarizing, those people are more likely to be staying in line. Your good risks have left. So that's the adverse selection problem. And the, the point here is this. Banks uh, don't, on average, do so much rationing via interest rates as they do by credit scoring. In other words, trying to discover the credit worthiness of their potential borrowers. We also have the moral hazard effect. The idea here is also uh, pretty straightforward. You think, well, gosh, okay, once you've dealt with the adverse selection uh, problem, you know, you've, you've lent money to good risks. You think, gosh, you know, my, my job is done here, so I've only loaned money to people who are very likely to pay it back. Well, not quite. Moral hazard is all about what happens after the loan has been made, because you're not out of the woods yet if you're a banker. What happens here is now firms are playing with other people's money. So a company, for example, has borrowed money from a bank, now they've got possibly an incentive problem because maybe after the loan is made, the company gets itself in a bit of trouble. So once it gets itself in a bit of trouble, it might have more incentive to sort of go for broke. You know, why not roll the dice, fund some risky investment project? If it pays off, that's terrific. It can pay the, the, uh, the uh, bank loan back. If it can't, well, too bad. It's in trouble anyways. So the, the, the idea here is the bank's or the uh, firm's incentive uh, is changed a little bit because it's playing with other people's money. And so what banks try to do, of course, is they try to, to structure loan contracts to prevent this sort of behavior, uh, and they do that uh, requiring companies to put up collateral, limiting the uh, other types of loans they can take out, and so forth. But it turns out that they can't perfectly protect themselves. They can't perfectly monitor or take care of or, or watch 
the behavior of what firms do with the money that is borrowed. Now, the important thing here, and so let's now get back to, to uh, the uh, monetary policy discussion, is that changes in interest rates and changes in the overall state of the economy affect the degree of adverse selection and affect the degree of moral hazard. And now let's go back to our expansionary monetary policy. And let's suppose that the, via some of the other channels we've already talked about is that the economy starts to get better and interest rates fall. Well, as the economy gets better and interest rates fall, the overall financial conditions of companies are going to improve. And so what you first start out with is that there are now fewer bad risks. So your adverse selection problem is reduced. And then plus, if the economy is doing better and firms are doing better, there's also therefore likely to be a lower problem with moral hazard. Firms won't have as much incentive to take uh, unnecessary or undue risks with the money that they've borrowed. And it's crucial here that once adverse selection and moral hazard issues are reduced, again reduced, not eliminated, is that the bank lending mechanism will function better. Banks will feel more comfortable in increasing loan volume and so we might see additional increases in investment and possibly also through consumer loans, increases in consumption. Both of those, of course, will tend to work to increase aggregate demand. You also have what's called the portfolio reallocation effect. And what happens here is that, uh, and again, an expansionary policy will tend to push down interest rates on risk-free assets. In the case of the Federal Reserve, for example, traditionally or historically, uh, the Fed has purchased uh, risk-free federal government assets, especially short-term financial assets, and so that the interest rates on those assets would tend to fall. And the way uh, financial market participants might react is they might uh, uh, move out of the risk-less assets that, offering, that are offering low yield and move into more risky assets that are offering a potentially higher yield. Now, when they do that, if enough uh, financial market participants do that, what you see is that uh, uh, the prices of risky assets tend to rise and their yields tend to fall a little bit. As a follow-on from that behavior is that the entities, the companies, and the other organizations that issue this risky, these, this, uh, risky sorts of assets, they'll be encouraged to issue more because they can sell those assets at a higher price and they can, in other words, pay a lower yield. And once they are able to do that, they have more funds to work with and you might see an increase in investment. And in addition, there might be a wealth effect uh, through which higher asset prices can increase net worth and that can increase consumption. We'll, we'll return to that here in just a few minutes or actually in the next video. But the bottom line is that aggregate demand will tend to rise. And so wrapping up here, uh, we know that changes in monetary policy can affect interest rates, both nominal interest rates and real interest rates. And once interest rates adjust, again, nominal or real, we can see changes in exchange rates, bank lending, consumption, investment, exports, imports, and other economic variables as well. So what we want to ask is this, well, does monetary policy solely depend on interest rates? And fortunately, especially in recent times, the answer is no. And so that will be the topic of our next video. Thank you very much.